So now we're going to go ahead and turn our attention to multi-map. And a multi-map has lots of things in common with map, with the major, major exception that it can have duplicate keys or non-unique keys. So for example, you might have a multi-map that would map student first names, to their last names, and of course, or last names to their first names, either way. And uh, the point is that there could be lots of people who would have the same first name or lots of people who could have the same last name. So those would not necessarily be unique. And we'll look at an example in a second that, that will demonstrate something along those lines. Its value type is also implemented as a pair that has a const key so it can't be changed and data. And keep in mind as always that this uses a balanced binary tree, a red black tree under the hood. So the items will be sorted in a multi-map even with multiple keys and it all works wonderfully and efficiently. So let's turn our attention to an example that'll demonstrate this. So now we're going to go ahead and take a look at an example that shows how to use multi-map in practice. And this is also a, a very fun example. So keep in mind that a multi-map is an ordered associative container that has the ability to support multiple key value bindings with duplicates, but other, otherwise it looks very, very similar to a map. In fact, its signature is identical, except the name is multi-map, not map. And uh, that's a good thing. Let's see, I think we can probably zap these includes. And so down here, we're gonna see how we're gonna use this. So we're gonna define a type def called names type, which will map string to string. And it's gonna be basically first name and last name. And then we're gonna define another type def called value type, which will be names type colon colon value type. See, these are just little shorthands, so we don't have to keep writing out all this verbose code everywhere. But then you're gonna define a stateful functor called print. And as you can see here, it's gonna stash away the O stream as a reference, and that's where we're gonna write the output to, so we can plug and play this to write to different output locations like a file or the standard output or the standard error or whatnot. And then we're gonna define the operator function call, which is what makes this a functor, of course. And as you can see here, that's going to be implemented to take a const name types colon colon value type, which is the type of element that we store in the map, and it'll take that as a const ref, and then it prints out the first name belongs to the second name's family. So these, of course, are gonna be people's names. So that's the functor. We're gonna use that to print the contents. Then we're also gonna define a couple of insertion operations that'll print out the contents of a multi-map and also print out the contents of a pair. And you'll see how that gets used in a second as well. So here's the insertion operator, which will take an O stream and a map by constref, and it'll basically use the venerable and always helpful for each algorithm to start at the beginning of the range and go from beginning to end. And each time through, it'll print, using the functor up here, it'll print out the contents of the map to the same output stream, the O stream that was passed in to this operator. And when we're done, we return the output stream because we've, of course, updated it and it has to come back by reference to be chained together, as you'll see in a moment. We define yet another operator that this is an insertion operator that's going to take a pair, which will have essentially two iterators. It'll have an iterator to the beginning of a range and an iterator to the end of a range. And what it'll do is it will use the for each algorithm, except this time, rather than doing begin and end on some kind of um, map, what it's going to do is it's going to go from the first element in the pair to the second element in the pair, because of course these are iterators and then it calls the print functor. So we're reusing the print functor again here to print to the appropriate output stream. And as with the previous version that printed out the map, the insertion operator that prints out a pair has to return the O stream by reference at the bottom. Okay, so armed with those little basic helper methods to, to make the rest of the code more concise and more c y looking, let's go ahead and show how to use various STL multi-map features. And we're gonna, we're gonna do a couple of different things here to illustrate this. Um, one thing we're gonna do first is we're gonna create an object called names type. And names type is a multi-map as we saw before, because we defined that up here. We type def multi-map string to string to be names type. So now we have a multi-map called names. 
And now we're going to go ahead and do a bunch of insertions in here. And we're going to put in people's names, their first name followed by their last name, where their first name is the key and the last name is the value. So here you can see we're going to go ahead and do it by inserting a value type, which has, say, Kim Smith, Jane Smith, K Smith. These are members of the Smith family, if you will. And uh, those are going to be inserted into the map. Now we're going to do something kind of cool here. We're going to do a hint-based insert. So this insert, we'll just go ahead and start at the top of the, the root of the binary tree and search from there to find out where that name value pair goes. This insert here, the one that starts with names.end as its first parameter, that's a hint-based insert. And what it does is it takes the iterator that's passed to it and it tries to see whether it can insert the next item into the tree without having to start searching from the top. And as it turns out, if we're clever as we are here, and we put things in in alphabetical order, then putting them into the tree with the hint, where the hint is the last iterator, is actually going to greatly speed up the time required to insert the elements into the map. So that'll basically end up putting them in and essentially um, if you have n elements to insert and you use this little trick, it'll basically take linear time to insert them. Whereas if you didn't use the hint, then it would basically take um, n log n time to insert them because you'd have to go through each element and then insert them, and the insert would take potentially log n time because it's a balanced binary tree. So iterators can be used to speed up inserts if you know something about the order in which you're trying to put your, your objects into the map. So we go ahead and put a bunch of other value types in there, and then we're going to do one more thing just to show the flexibility of this. We make ourselves a vector of value types. Where remember, value type is just this value type of the map. And into that vector of value types, we're going to have this called McKay names. So it's all the people in the McKay family. So we have Sophie McKay, Steve McKay, and Kim McKay. And so we add them into this vector. And then we can go ahead and insert into the map McKay names dot begin to McKay names dot end. And so what that's doing is that's taking that range in the vector and inserting that into the map. So you can see here we have three different ways of doing inserts. And one way is by just inserting the value type directly. The other way is by using the hint based approach with the iterator. That's this approach here. And then the third way is by giving it a range, which we constructed by using our vector. So those are just a couple of different alternative ways of, of doing things. And there's other variants on the theme here as well. Uh, you'll notice, by the way, that for multi-maps, there is no operator subscript. So they don't have subscript operation. You have to do the insert, uh, as we've seen here. So there's, they got rid of the, uh, the subscript operation. All right, now what we're going to do is we're going to print out the names. So we say, see out all the names, endl. And then we use names here. And of course, what this is going to end up calling is it's going to end up calling this insertion operation, which will take the names object and write it to the output string, in this case, C out. So isn't that nice and clean? And it's so cool that you can use these user-defined insertion operations to be able to integrate what you're trying to print into the overall syntax of IO streams. So we print all the names. And then what we're going to do is we're going to have some fun here. We're going to go ahead and ask the map, find me a pair of iterators to everybody whose name is Kim. Because remember, we have several Kims. We have Kim Smith, Kim Jones, and Kim McKay. And so down here, when we do the equal range operation, it gives us back a pair using that very helpful pair template again. And it gives us an iterator pair from the beginning of the range where Kim first appears up to, but not including the element right after that. So everything between the first and the second will be the elements that correspond to the name Kim. And then what we do is we go ahead and say there are X number of Kims, count number of Kims, in this case, there'll be three. And we go ahead and print out the pair. And so that pair that we're printing out, of course, is going to use this insertion operation that takes a pair. So I think that's also really cool too. So notice once again that we kind of keep the printing to be very canonical. We always use the IO streams operations. We can define our own insertion operations to take 
maps or, or multi-maps or pairs and print them as we see fit. And then you'll notice that these insertion operations themselves are factored to use for each and to reuse the print functor. So the, the key theme to note here is whenever possible, try not to write the same code over and over again. Don't repeat yourself. And this is going to be a theme when I give back my, my comments on your assignment number three. One of the themes that's going to really come out is don't repeat yourself. So there's a lot of code that's replicated in people's solutions. And so one of the things we're going to learn is not to write code over and over again, but instead to create helper methods and refactor the code so that you can write it one time, test it one time, document it one time, and then reuse it over and over again. So that's what's often called systematic reuse. Very important concept to understand. All right, so the last thing we're gonna do here is once we've printed out all the Kims, we're gonna get rid of everybody named Kim, we're gonna erase them. And the way we're gonna do that is we're gonna give it a range from first to second in this pair. So we're gonna go erase a range. So you can do that, you can erase a range. And then down here, we're gonna go ahead and print the new multi-map without Kim. Kim's been voted off the island, if you will. And then the last thing we're gonna do is we're gonna go find Kurt. We're gonna get an iterator back to Kurt. And then assuming that we find Kurt, and we should find Kurt because there's a Kurt Jones in here, as you can see. If we find Kurt, then we go ahead and print Kurt's last name by being able to say iter arrow second. Okay, so that's a whole lot of stuff. So let's go ahead and run this code. And as you can see here, let's take a look at the output. So originally we get the complete list of everybody. So here are all the names, everybody in the Smith family, everybody in the Jones family, everybody in the, the K family. And notice how this is sorted by first name, not by last name. Of course, we, we could have written our own comparison operation to sort it by last name if we'd wanted to, but we're just showing the basic features here. Then we go ahead and find everybody named Kim. Then we get rid of everybody named Kim. So now there's no more Kims left. And then we go ahead and find out that Kurt's last name is indeed Jones, which is correct. So this is a fun example that illustrates the various features associated with multi-maps. Now, believe it or not, we actually have another example in this family of things. And so let's go ahead and open that up and take a look at that. So that is going to be this example. So this example is a slight variant of the example we looked at before with uh, a few little tweaks to show off yet some other features that you can use with maps. So as before, uh, in this particular case, to make it more clear what's actually going on, we're going to use a multi-map of simple strings, which of course is our teaching aid that looks like a string, but is going to print out the contents of when its various methods are being called. So we can kind of get a better sense of what's going on underneath the hood. We're going to have a functor here to print things out. That's pretty much identical to before. We have the insertion operation that prints out a map or a multi-map in this case, just like we did before. And um, But we're going to do a few other simpler things here. In particular, we're going to demonstrate the difference between insert and in place, and then of course in place hint. So if you recall before, I showed you a whole bunch of different variants of using insert. So we did insert with a value type, like we're doing here. We saw insert with a hint, and then we saw insert with a range. And so what we're gonna do here is we're just gonna focus in on a handful of these examples to kind of keep the program a little bit more stripped down and just focus on something new. So here what we're gonna do is we're first gonna show insert with value type, and that, of course, is going to use this version of insert. And you can see that this version of insert is going to take a, uh, an R value reference. So it's going to be able to do some, some optimizations under the hood that won't require the full-blown copy of everything. And uh, we'll talk about that in a second. And then down here, we're going to go ahead and use the in-place operation. So in place for a map is very much like in place back for a vector or a deck. It's going to do even further optimizations so we have even less overhead when we put our elements into the map. And if you take a look at in place, you can see that in place takes this variadic arguments parameter and uses the magic forward mechanism 
in C++ in order to be able to construct this object in place. So it'll have even less overhead. And uh, then the final thing we're going to do down here is we're going to go ahead and show in place hint, where we're going to basically do in place, but we're going to give it the iterator as a hint. And that will, of course, mean that not only are we going to do less overhead for copying the parameters, but we're also going to be faster as far as searching, because we'll be able to go straight to where we need to be. OK, so let's run this code and see what happens. All right, so of course, I use the simple string. So we see the output, and you can see the output is more verbose. Um, so here we do starting insert. And you can see that what insert is doing is it's making a, uh, it's making a simple string for Kim and Smith and Jane and Smith and Kay and Smith. That's what all these calls are. And then it's going ahead and it's passing that simple string in. Um, and we're making the value type from that. So that's what those things are. And then when we actually go ahead and insert these things, then it's using other magic in order to make that work more efficiently. But you can see that there's a fair amount of overhead for doing this copy constructor. And then we have to go ahead and delete the string as well, and it frees the memory. So there's a fair amount of overhead with insert. Let's go down here and look at in place. Look at in place relative to insert. Wow, it is so much more efficient. And so all we're doing here is it's simply forwarding these parameters, uh, rather these parameters, <laughs> Kurt and Jones. It's using the magic of variadic templates, as you can see here. And it's basically just constructing them in place, which is why it's called M place, could be in place. It's, it's constructing those objects in place in the context of where it needs to go in the map, or in the multi-map in this case. And so as a result, the uh, amount of overhead is just so much smaller for the, the version that uses the in-place operation. So I think you'll agree, just visually inspecting this, that this is so much more concise than all the code that has to be called in order to handle the semantics of doing insert here. And there are even more inefficient ways of doing things uh, if we really want to put our mind to it. Um, I won't show them to you right now, but if we had actually made an object called value type and then passed that in, that would have triggered the copy constructor and it would have been even more expensive. So the key lesson here is try to use in place wherever possible because it can really speed up the amount of code. It, it speeds up the performance by eliminating a lot of extra copying code. Uh, someone had asked a question about move semantics on the Piazza forum, and so I provided a link to a really nice article that talks about why move semantics exist and what the standard move method does to facilitate move semantics. And it's really worth taking a look at to understand why we need all this stuff um, and why the earlier versions of C++ were deficient in that respect. Then you can also see that in place hint, basically has the same optimization in place does, but then it also optimizes how quickly the element can be added into the map because it gives it the iterator at the end. Now, this is only really going to work for Sophie and Steve because they have values that are higher than everything else that's currently in the map. So giving it the end iterator will actually make a difference. Conversely, poor old Kim, the Kims are always the, the odd people out here they are not going to benefit from this hint because Kim is less than Steve lexicographically. So the uh, in-place hint will quickly realize that. It'll say, whoop, can't do that optimization. And then it'll have to go ahead and start from the top or the root of the tree and then traverse down to find out where Kim goes. Now, that's not the end of the world. It's, it's still going to be bounded by log n. But if you can get away with the hint and do it in constant time, that's clearly preferable from any perspective uh, in big O notation, or just how to make your code run faster in general. OK, and when we're all done, we just print out the contents of the map. And then a whole pile of destructors get called, as you can see here, to clean everything up. 